I should probably get started. Um, so, talking a little about how population geneticists think about selection and different models of selection, uh, selective sweeps, and so on. After that, uh, I now want to move into more how do people try to detect selection in, uh, in data. And um, so, I got to start by motivating it with this. Um, just going to have to. Um, Starts where I was supposed to start. Yeah. So I'm gonna. There's two reasons why people are interested in detecting selection um, and relating natural selection um, and models of natural selection to data. The one first one is so what you might immediately think of that you are interested in where has there been natural selection trying to understand processes of adaptation in natural sp species and so on and the other one is that there has been big con controversy in the field about how important is natural selection so initially much talk discussion about natural selection in in humans and other populations will concentrate on the fact is on how, mu how much natural selection is there actually that was the big question, and that question um, dates back to, in fact, before that, but was really uh, came to the forefront with uh, Moto Kimura's um, 1969 paper, where he proposed what he called the neutral theory, that if you look at most differences between species and within species, the genetic variation uh, there between and within species, that that is really caused by genetic drift, new mutations entering, and then genetic drift acting on them, and not explained by natural selection. At that point in time, what people had of data was, of course, very limited. And I think the view for many people was that when you see some differences between species, it's because it's adaptive. It's because there's a reason why there's a difference. Natural selection has favored that. And Moto Kimura then came, theoretical population analysis came in and argued it's probably, probably not. It's completely neutral. There's no reason why you have those differences except the random facts, uh, processes of mutation and genetic drift. Okay, so much of the, for the next 20, 30 years, much research was really focused on trying to test that hypothesis. And many of the ways of detecting selection was developed in that context. And they were called, they're called test of neutrality. So you typically formulate the problem as a, there's no hypothesis that, that there's no selection. And you're trying to see if you can reject that null hypothesis. And the tests aiming of that, aim to do that, they're called tests of neutrality. So, Focusing on this question of, well, how important is natural selection before I get more in depth with the test of neutrality? Perhaps one of the most important papers for that question was this a paper by Bigon and Aguadro from 1992, where the, they showed that if you look at recombination rates, so this coefficient of exchange, that's a measure of recombination rate, and then nucleotide diversity, so a measure of how much unique variability there is, you find a positive correlation. Pi is the average number of pairwise differences. So it's a co very common measure that population genetics use to measure how much genetic variability there is, which is one way to think about how it's calculated is you take all pairs of sequences, calculate the number of differences between them, and then average over all comparisons, the average number of pairwise differences. Sometimes it's also called nucleotide diversity of pi. And so you saw that you see this, they, they observe this positive correlation, which has been, go ahead. Sorry, is each dot a species here? Each dot is a, a different part of the genome in, a, in the genome. So if you look at different parts of the genome, the different recombination rates in different part of the genome. So you could take you know, this part of the genome and this part of the genome and this part of the genome. And if you do that and then plot what's the recombination rate in that part of the genome and what's the nucleotide diversity in that part of the genome, you find this positive correlation. So what's the significance of the two types of dots? That is lost in history, I think. I do remember. X chromosome versus autosome. X chromosome versus autosome, okay. So, yeah, it's a very famous plot, this one, from a, a nature paper that uh, some know better than others, clearly. Uh, so, uh, thanks for that. Um, so, this is a pattern that's been confirmed in many other species. You see the same thing in humans. It's not as pronounced as this was for Drosophila, uh, fruit flies, but you also see it in humans. And, one of the part of the arguments about this was then early arguments about this was well this is exactly what we expect from the selective sweep models because the region that's been affected by a selective sweep by this process of an ad adaptive mutation increasing in frequency 
uh, in the population. The region affected by that is determined by the recombination rate. If there's a lot of recombination, many mutations will escape the selective sweep, not a very big region will be affected. If there's no recombination or low recombination rates, a very large region in the genome will be affected. Okay, so if there are lots of selective sweeps, you would predict a positive correlation like this. And this initially was taken to be evidence of uh, selective sweeps in the genome. So one, the last class of model on selection I'm going to talk about is an alternative hypothesis that was uh, proposed by Brian Charlesworth and colleagues. And what he was saying is, well, you could imagine just having um, lots of negative selection, and it can actually generate uh, a similar pattern. And uh, it occurs if mutations are negative selected, but they're not so negative selected that they immediately weed it out. They're negative selected, but they can still segregate by genetic drift. They can still increase in frequency and segregate in the population. The effect of that, uh, well, the effect, that will affect many properties of the genetic data, but one effect is that it will reduce the amount of variability just simply because of the selection acting against uh, these different classes of chromosomes that have different number of deleterious mutations. And in, a, in one paper, a very similar approximation was uh, developed that showed that if you have a mutation rate mu towards deleterious mutation, and each of them has a selection coefficient s and dominance coefficient h, you get this civil relationship. You could describe like, the amount of genetic variability as a simple change on the effective population size. So if this is n without back, this kind of background selection, and you multiply by, take the exponent of this and multiply with that, then you get a new effective population size that describes the reduction in variability. Or you can think of it as taking the average number of pairwise differences from before under selection, divided by what it would be without selection, approximately proportional to this, this function here. Okay, so that's, go ahead. Uh, that's a good question. Is there any empirical evidence in favor of the neutral uh, hypothesis? I mean, the, the you know, number of uh, early observations that seem to be in accordance with that that people were invoking were, for example, that you have a, about, con when we compare different species, you have about constant rate of mutation in different lineages. So mutation occur at, a, at about, accumulate on different lineages in different species at about a constant rate. So that's something you would predict from a neutral model. There are also many selection models that will predict the same thing. But that was some of the early evidence that was used to say, okay, this is compatible with neutrality. But most of the time, the way people have formulated the question is, can we reject it to be neutral? So uh, the neutral model has been a null hypothesis. And I think these days, this is sort of a historical perspective. These days, I don't think many people are really interested in whether the neutral hypothesis is true or not. We know there's a large amount of selection, many places in the genomes. We know also that many, many mutations are neutral, and we're not so concerned about whether the neutral hypothesis is right or wrong as such as we're interested in understanding particular examples of how selection works. Um, so I think nobody would say, I've, you might find some people that say, well, the neutral hypothesis was right or something like that. Most genetic variation is neutral. But I think most population geneticists probably don't think like that today. I, I, there are all population geneticists in the audience that can tell me, chip in with their opinions about the status of the field. But I think it's not, uh, it's more a historical perspective. I don't think anybody really set it up, I'll it's selection or neutrality, but varying degrees of that. I think creationists would say we may Perhaps, perhaps. I don't know. I'm not an expert on that, but I'll, I'll trust you. All right, so um, anyway, so you can, you can, as a first approximation, you can look at background selection, the effect of these delet weakly deleterious mutations segregating in, in, in the population as being a reduction in effective population size that then also will reduce the amount of genetic variability that you see. It turns out uh, there's also quite a bit of effect on allele frequencies and so on, but at least you can. Uh, the strongest effect will be on this uh, effective population size, and you can see this reduction in variability. And you have can add recombination to that. So this is this is for a linked neutral a marker that is neutral linked to a region in which mutations occur at this rate without recombination. And you can develop similar expressions where you have uh, a point in the genome, and then you have recombination to other points in the genome, and then you can look at uh, what's the reduction in variability that you would expect uh, under a model like that. So, um, so this model makes the same prediction as the model before. The more recombination is, the stronger an effect you will see of the 
of, of the background selection and you will see uh, or the less effect of the, of the background selection and you would see then because of that also po positive correlation between nucleotide diversity and, and recombination. Okay, you can take the models also, you can fit it to data. So here's some from a paper by Kaplan and Hudson where they take this model of background selection and they fit it to a particular position uh, in the genome uh, using various selection coefficients and some information about uh, recombination rates in the genome. Okay, so much of this has been going on for many, many years now, discussion about what are the factors that determine genetic variability in the population. Most of the time now, as I was saying, people are more interested in looking at specific instances of natural selection and trying to understand that. And there's sort of a jungle out there of different, more or less, ad hoc methods for trying to detect selection. And why is that? Uh, well, in part because really, you know, a sort of a full likelihood approach where you calculate the joint probability for many low, many positions in the genome and try to make tests of whether she fit different models and see if selection is acting in a particular position. They're very, very difficult to come by. I mean, the, computationally, because of this problem with the coalescence process, as I described before, on, on modeling the coalescence process with selection, it's, these models like that are really intractable. So instead, most of the time what we have is this variety of different tests that people are trying to look at one feature of the data or another to see, is that compatible with a neutral model or do we need to invoke selection uh, to be able to explain our data. And one way to think about it is that you can have different forms of selection that will make different predictions of different types of the data. So for example, if you have a selective sweep, that will lead to a decrease in interspecific variability, so population genetic variability. But if you look at variability between species, it won't lead to a reduction in that. So you would expect if there have been many mutations that goes to fixation, you would see an increase in the rate of substitution. That is accumulation of differences between species. But as they go to fixation within species, there will be a reduction in variability. Okay. So people are, looking at, are interested in properties like that to try to detect areas uh, in the genome that are under selection. And again, one of the things that, as I mentioned before, that people are using, one of the tools is this degeneracy of the genetic code that we have 64 possible triplets but only 20 amino acids. Go ahead. Sorry, um, you may have mentioned this already, but what's, what's uh, the distinction between interspecific and intra? So intra, that's population genetic vari variability, so within a species. So we take, you know, we are all from the same species, so we compare DNA sequence between us. We've compared it to a chimpanzee, that would be intraspecific between species variability. So population genetic versus sometimes also called comparative. That's comparisons between different species. So one of the things that people have been taking great amounts of to detect selection in many different ways, again, is this degeneracy of the genetic code. So same logic as before. If the selection, it should mostly act at the protein level. So we can use comparisons between these non-synonymous and synonymous mutations to say something about whether selection is acting. And much of the literature at least, you know, uh, until 10 years ago, that where I think where people were successful in really pinpointing positive selection, that is selection that has favored a new mutation, so it's increased in frequency, um, was really based on not so much population genetic data, but comparing different species, so the interspecific variability by comparing different species. And the basic logic people are using, you can also use the same logic within species, just have more power between species, is you look at accumulation of mutations of these two types of mutations, non-synonymous and synonymous mutations. And you ask the question, are there more non-synonymous mutations than you would expect given the information you got from synonymous mutations about mutation rates? So is there any evidence that selection has favored accumulation of non-synonymous mutations? All right, and so people, um, look at these DNDS ratio. In a moment, I will define more rigorously what a DNDS ratio is. This is the way that most biologists think about DNDS ratio. So I'll go through that first, but then define it a little bit more precisely in a moment. So if you, this process, you just have a little bit of patience. So this is the way that most of the time you will see explain, explained uh, this DNDS ratio. You count numbers, non-synonymous mutations between species, synonymous mutations between species. And you also count the number of sites in which a mutation would result in a non-synonymous change or a synonymous change. And then you can get a ratio or a number of non-synonymous substitutions per non-synonymous site and number of synonymous substitutions per synonymous site. And the idea is that if there was no selection acting at the protein level, if it doesn't matter which amino acid you have, these two should be identical to each other. So this DNDS ratio, which also is called omega, 
That's the same as the DNDS, DNDS ratio. That should be equal to one. So that's neutrality, selective neutrality, no selection. If um, selection is acting against new amino acid mutations, so that they go to fixation at a lower rate than what you would expect for neutral mutation, then omega should be less than one. And if they're favored by natural selection, so they go to fixation at a rate that's higher than what you would expect uh, for neutral mutation, then we talk about positive selection. So you hear these words, negative selection and positive selection, a lot. Originally, I think they are defined in terms of, you think, a two allele model, that something is selected negatively or positively, right? Whether it's favored or not favored. In these models, it's then been translated into that positive selection means that you have an increase in the rate of substitution above that that you would expect from a neutral mutation. And negative selection is then the opposite. Okay, so this whole thing, you know, there are a number of problems with the way I presented this. Most of all, that there's no such thing, for example, as a synonymous site. Okay, because um, if you go back and look at the genetic code, you have things like this. You know, you have, you know, if you look at the third position here, if you have a change for a, from a C to an A, you change the amino acid, but C to a U, you don't change the amino acid, okay? So at the site as such is not synonymous or non-synonymous. It's some fraction there and so on. So there are lots of papers in the early 90s on, oh, how can we reject this? Or how can we um, take that into account? I think people end, what people end up doing instead is saying, okay, we can define it uh, in a different way in terms of thinking of the substitution process as uh, a Marco chain with state base on the 61 possible uh, sense codons. So free codons, free triplets of nucleotides code for stop codons. So they're not allowed. So there's 61 left, 61 triplets of nucleotides. Now you can set up a Marco chain. Before we get into to this, I mean, it also seems kind of like strange that you're, you're, it lumps all non-synonymous mutations together into one category. Uh, you could imagine that, you know, most non-synonymous substitutions are bad, but, you know, there's a good one there that will happen. Exactly. There'll be another good yeah, one. Yeah, Those yeah. will happen. And but that's, in fact, something that people do uh, model that. So you can model that. You can put in a, dis there's a distribution of different DNDS ratios in different sites, for example. And you can also let that depend on where you are in the protein structure and so on. There's lots of models like that. All right. So anyway, so, so you define this macro uh, process on the state space on the 61 possible sense codons. And then you have transition rates in that macro model as follows. This is a simple model and many other models, but it's sort of the simplest type of model people use. You, um, here you divide between transitions and transversions. These are two different types of mutations. It doesn't really matter in this, but rates are proportional to the stationary frequency of that codon. Okay, so a codon is a triplet, that's stash in this macro model, it's an ergodic model, there's a stationary distribution, you have a stationary probabilities of each um, triplet of each codon, and you mu mutate from state I to state J proportional to the frequency or uh, the probability of being in state J, the marginal probability. And then you have a mo something that modifies the rate depending on whether it's non-synonymous or synonymous. So if you have a non-synonymous mu mutation, you multiply by this rate modifier omega here. So that's the DNDS ratio from before. So now that might, things might make a little bit more sense. If omega is equal to one, there's nothing that distinguishes non synonymous and synonymous mutations, right? There's nothing that's going on at the protein level. But if selection works against new changes, omega will be less than one. If it works in favor of new changes, omega will be larger than one. Okay, and now we can specify hypotheses about omega. And you can do things like allowing omega to vary among different sites, and diff different categories. And in particular, you can ask the question, are there any evidence of any sites, any positions in the genome or the, the genes you're looking at where omega is larger than one, where there has been positive selection? And that's been used many, many, many times to look at selection. So for example, in viruses, this is a, um, this is a viral particle uh, Remember, a virus is sort of a little, a little particle that has just encapsulated some RNA or DNA inside of it that it will inject into the host cell. Okay, so it's not really a living organism in the same that's not a, a real cell. But this is, this is a viral particle from, influ from the influenza virus that's attached to a, a host cell. On the surface of that viral particle, you have these little pegs here. That's a molecule called hemagglutinin. And what our immune system reacts to is that molecule primarily. So we, our immune system will recognize 
the motif that it sees in that protein. And the reason why we get influenza you know, epidemics again and again and again and again is that that protein evolves very, very fast. So we, evolve, we gain resistance to one version of it, but then this molecule will mutate and there will be positive selection then, there will induce positive selection in that molecule. So this is a, a, a cartoon of that molecule. So this is like one little pack here that's been blown up in a cartoon like this. And it, these are residues, particular positions in the protein where there's a particularly high, where there's strongly st statistical significant evidence for a DNDS ratio, a value of omega that's larger than one. That is, positions where there's a, such a high turnover allele, it can't be explained by just genetic drift and mutation. So selection must have favored change in those positions. That happens to also be positions where exponentially you can show that they can be targeted for the um, human immune system, that the epitopes for that. Okay, so that's an example of how these methods have been used. I have some other examples. I'm not really sure if I want to go through them. Maybe I'll just do a little bit about human evolution. You can you do the same thing in humans. So we diverged about five, six million years ago from chimpanzees. And you can ask, what are the positions in the human genome where there's a lot of selection acting there? And if you do that, you find that, uh, and that's what people have been finding again and again and again, looking in, in many different species, that the genes that show most evidence of this type of positive selection where the most residues that seem to be targeted by positive selection favoring change uh, is uh, genes that are highly expressed in or have function related to immunity and defense, in particular T cell mediated immunity. What's the reason for that? Well, those are the genes that respond to these changing viruses and other pathogens. And so they like the pathogenic environment change all the time, so does our immune system in response to that. I like number four. Yeah, the unclassified biological products. This is an old slide. There are fewer of them that are unclassified now. Um, this is back from 2005. So, all right. So, uh, so that is, um, you know, one way that people have used to detect selection by comparing different species. In terms of the population genetic variation, as I mentioned, there's a host of different possible tests. And this is one of the most popular one and famous one. A test called the McDonald Kreitman test. It's based on the same principle. You divide mutations between synonymous and non synonymous mutations, but then you don't just look between species, you also look within species. And then you can show quite easily, very simple argument, that under neutrality in expectation, the ratio of A to B should equal the ratio of C to D. That is the ratio of within to between species variability, if you count the number of mutations, should be the same for non synonymous and synonymous mutations. That's quite easy to show. And then you can simply test if that is true by using a test of homogeneity, a chi-square test or a G-test or Fisher's test, test or something like that. And you can test if these ratios, in fact, are equal to each other. And people have been doing that to a great extent in many different um, species. You can also use the Poisson random field models of Sawyer and Hartle that we talked about before. And then you can predict what would be the, what the expected values in these categories. And then you can make, do something model-based if you believe in those models, where you can then estimate selection coefficients. And this is an example of that, a map of selection in the human genome, where everything that's in red, that's where there's negative selection acting. So selection is acting on segregating uh, mutations that are negatively selected. And the blue ones is where there's evidence for positive selection. Um, and again, this is, this is also back from 2005 or 6. I think if you did it today, we have much more data, much more complete data you would probably fill in many, many more loci than this. Okay, so here's another test. This is, in fact, the first test that was developed on nucleotide, to, to deal with nucleotide data, DNA sequence data. And this, it turns out, still to be a tremendously powerful test. Actually, compared to many other tests that have been developed subsequently, this test still has a lot of power on the many settings that you're interested in. And the logic is a little bit the same as before. You have now, the vocabulary that I use has changed to segregating sites, that's variability within species. You can count the number of mutations you observe within species. Fixed differences, that's the number of differences you observe between species. And now, instead of comparing non synonymous and synonymous mutations, you compare different positions in the genome. Here I have two loci uh, in, the, in the genome, but it could be, you know, you could you know, dice and slice the genome any way you want. And, um, as before, you would expect 
the ratio of segregating size to fixed differences to be the same for all loci. You can show that if there's no selection, you would expect any expectation that should be true. And then you can defi find a chi-square statistic that's trying to uh, ask, you could get the expected values in a table like this, and a two by k table of loci and these two categories, get the expected number in each category, you can get approximation of the variance, define a statistic, and then ask if the value of that statistic is so extreme that you can reject the null hypothesis that the ratio is the same. So why are you doing something different here? Now we're not doing, this is something to get the distribution of the statistic, you actually need simulations. And the reason why this is different from the case before, there you could do a normal test of homogeneity, you can't do that here. Um, that's because that is um, a, correlation, uh, a correlation between the segregating sites with inner locus. Okay, that correlation um, is essentially due to the shared coalescence tree between the different sites uh, in that locus. So that means that you wouldn't expect, given S1 plus S2, S1 is not binomially distributed anymore. If you do it, did it for the mcdowell kreitman test, it actually turns out that logic worked there because synonymous and non synonymous sites, they share the same uh, gene tree, uh, same genealogy. They have the same coalescence tree, they're interspersed among each other. But different loci here have different uh, uh, coalescence trees. So here you cannot simply do a... Uh, so, so the, the null hypothesis here is that the ratio of segregating to fixed differences, the ex expected number of segregating to fixed differences is the same for all loci. So that the ratio is constant. So that's perhaps perhaps the most common neutrality test, uh, competing with one or two other ones, and the first one on DNA sequence data, and still surprisingly uh, powerful. And of course, where does the power come from? If you have, I'm just going to finish that. I'll take your question. If there's been a selective sweep, it will reduce the number of segregating sites. If you have lots of you know fast evolving genes favored by positive selection, that will increase the number of fixed differences. So that kind of selection will change this ratio of segregating to fixed differences. Okay, so segregating means that if I take us as a population mm -hmm. and then I look at the positions in which we differ from each other, count how many there are positions like that. That's the number of segregating sites. Yeah. Okay, fixed differences, those are differences if we take uh, a population of us and a population of chimpanzees and ask what's the difference between those. Mm -hmm. So the fixed, these are, you know, ultimately you want to set it up so these are multiply exclusive, you can't be in this set and also in that set. Oh, I see. So one is, one is within species and one's one is between exactly species. Exactly. Okay. But the problem is that it's very dependent upon the size of the sample. Oh, yeah. And these so are all statistics, all which may be useful for small samples. They're pretty lousy for big samples because there's a huge amount of information when it's thrown out. Oh, yeah. No. Okay. So that's, there's another issue here about like throwing out information and sample sizes. I think in any case, it's clearly useful with anything I've been talking about so far, you're throwing away a lot of information. Independent of sample sizes. No, but even the but definitions. They, but the other the issue, the other issue with the sample sizes is the fact that you know you could have some some shared polymorphism that is not fixed, for example, and that the categorization of what is is segregating versus fixed will depend on your sample size, and so on. So there's some issues between that that are swept under the carpet. But this is uh, so usually the way this is done when people actually apply the test. They take a sample from one population and find all, just count how much is segregating in that population. And then they compare to a reference other species. So for example, humans, chimpanzees. And then assume any difference is a fixed difference. I think one of the difficulties is people started doing that when there was very limited data. And they continue doing that when there's huge amounts of data. Um, yeah, I disagree with that. I think for very little data, it's an even bigger problem. Because there you have such a sparsity of information. You really want to get all the information out of it. Now we have such huge data sets. We can better afford to throw out some of the information. But therefore, we shouldn't use these kind of tests anymore. So that's why there's a tremendous amount of research in how to do that better. But uh, many of the new tests that have been proposed, in fact, on many scenarios perform worse than this. This is still a test that beats many published tests if you simulate the power. So for example, if you take this test and compare to many of the haplotype-based statistics for detecting selection <laughs> under most parameter values, this actually does better than most of those tests. Does this still? Uh, 
only consider polymorphisms in the exon regions? No, this can be applied to any way you slice or dice the genome. Unlike the last one. Yeah, unlike the last one, yeah. So that's uh, in some sense the advantage of, of, of this. I think there is also an issue here about what one means by working well. Right? So one, one definition of working well is that you get something which is more statistically significant. But if you actually look at the plots of the data, they're all over the place. You wouldn't guess that it's obviously there. The other one is if you have you know, two models, one null model or some other model, and you look at the data, and they clearly differ from one or look better with the other, independent of whether you can do some you know, official statistical test. Right? And somehow, I think those issues often tend to get confused as to what one means by good. Yeah, I mean, to avoid confusion, the way this is formulated is that you have a neutral null hypothesis. You're trying to see if you can reject that. So it's pretty specific in that sense. It's not, it's not formulated as a model choice problem yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. So, but, but I think maybe what you're saying is that we should ask different questions. Right. Right. Okay. Right. You, That's you, that, fair enough. If I could just jump in, just add one little bit of information. Um, I don't know about the HKA test, but if you go to the McDonald Kreitman test, you know, just basically the, you change the columns to um, synonymous versus non synonymous. Um, you, using the extra data that you get, I mean, you can go for something from something that has an ROC of like, um, basically your power to detect positive selection is like 50% at a reasonable false positive rate. You, once you start pooling information across the gene, you just do a simple mixed effects model, you get like 99% power. So having more data really can help. Yeah, that. certainly, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no... But if having more data can't help, there's something wrong. It, it can help. It does it help. Can, it, it, it does. I mean, it gets... It helps hugely if you start looking at better quantities, right? I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess, I, are you making an argument that this is not optimal? Because I don't think anybody would ever claim it's optimal. I'm just saying that this is one of the tests that have been used, and compared to many other tests, it has more statistical power for, you know, to reject the specific hypothesis people are interested in, whether uh, the data can be explained by no, neutral null hypothesis. The argument here is not that this is optimal and that you should go back and do that. I'll get it. I'll, um, uh, I will s give you a test that even works, but in more use then. Um, so see if you, if perhaps you, you ought to like this even less. So this is perhaps the, the most used test, if any. This is the Tadimus D test. What that does is, now we're using only variation within a population. And we want to look if the distribution of allele frequencies are compatible with what you would expect from the neutral expectation. And it's set up in a very simple way. You have two commonly used, very simple estimators of uh, the population genetic parameter of theta, which is equal to four times the population type times the mutation rate. None of these, est none of these estimators are, um, so uh, are based on sufficient statistics. They're, they're not uh, maximum likely the estimators, and they're not sufficient. sufficient. Uh, but here we have one that's based on the number of segregating sites. S here is the number of mutations you actually see in the population. That's Watterson's estimator. Here's another one that's based on the average number of pairwise differences. That's what we called pi before. Okay, so these are two different estimators. You can show that both, under this standard assumptions, they're both unbiased estimators. So what Tajima suggests is using as a test to, to use when you see a difference between the values from those two estimators and use that as a statistical test. Why would you do that? Well, this one just count the number of sites. This one actually uses information about allele frequencies. So this particular statistic here, if there's selection, this is less affected than this uh, statistic here. So if there's negative selection, for example, you have more mutations of uh, Low allele frequency, positive selection more. High allele frequency, we get a different distribution if the selective sweeps. All of that can be captured to a certain degree by this statistic, where it's just simply the difference between these two estimates divided by uh, uh, an expression for the variance in the square root of the variance in the distance derived under the hypothesis of no recombination. Okay, so that's the most common used statistic, and perhaps. You know, it's using a bit of information about allele frequencies that the other tests don't use, but generally it doesn't have very much power compared to many other tests that people have developed. Say so there are very, very few sort of more principled tests that have been developed, but one uh, was developed originally by Wolfgang Steffen. Sorry, Rasmus, okay. did you just speak that you mean under the variance under the hypothesis of no selection? On no selection and no recombination. Yeah, right. I mean, the no selection and no, this variance here, divide, yeah. that expression divide under no recombination. You can also derive on a free recombination, 
under um, it becomes hard if there is some recombination to get at this expression. It depends on the expected uh, the expectation of the total tree length in two two sides, which we don't really have uh, uh, simple expressions for. Question. So, so is is there an additional assumption here of of the population being in equilibrium? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is all, this is an assumption. The assumption is you, you're really rejecting a very composite null hypothesis that has in it no selection. It has in it various assumptions, depending on how you've done it, on recombination. It's certainly a lot of assumption about demography. Okay. So therefore, people are, are, I've been quite worrying. I will talk a little bit about the effect of demography later on. Um, but people have certainly been very uh, skeptical about the use of that, the naive use of that. But it's used all the time for people, for example, scanning a genome, looking at what's the value of the GMSD and finding the place in the genome where it's most extreme and so on. All right, so a little bit, and step towards um, more principled methods that still are not full likelihood methods. But these are methods that calculate the likelihoods in one side on the hypothesis about there's been a selective sweep on the other side. Taking into account selection coefficients, recombination, and so on, can make a likely ratio relating to the hypothesis of selection versus no selection applicable to one side. And then form a composite likelihood by taking the products of these marginal likelihoods along the sequence. Okay, so there's a lot of, you know, tradition in statistics for forming estimators like this when it's, it's, you can't make a full likelihood approach. So there's a theory of estimation, estimation equations that look at estimators that are not full likelihood estimators, and also a, a growing theory on composite likelihood methods that are formed like this. And what uh, Wolfgang did together with his student at that point uh, was that they took uh, population dating models, like the one we've been talking about, and then could get the predictions of what you would see in a site that's linked to a site that's been on a selection, and also get predictions of the distribution if there hadn't been selection, and use that to uh, form this uh, composite likelihood ratio. Um, and I, I worked on a different version that does things like differently, and the slide is for that. But um, maybe the main, main thing here is just that you can derive these prob marginal probabilities for each locus, take the product of them along the sequence to form these composite likelihoods. Now, you use more of the information now because you use information about allele frequencies and the spatial pattern in the genome of allele frequencies. So it's particularly good for locating where was there a selective sweep, uh, these methods. But it's still not a full likelihood method. Uh, and the reason why it's not is it's very hard to compute, whereas this is very easy to compute. So back to the issue about demography, the assumptions about the distribution of allele frequencies depends heavily on uh, demography. So for example, uh, here you have this statistic to GMSD, under a model in which this is a standard neutral model, that's the black bars there, and then a model where the, the, this uh, population you assemble from exchanges migrants with some other population at a rate of one migrant every 10 generations. And then you get the distribution, you can see it has much bigger tails, both negative and positive values, and so you would tend to get a large amount of false positives if you thought that this was the correct all distribution, but really there has been migrant with another population. And of course, real populations, there are always these kind of complexities, meaning that uh, nobody really believes these days that if you take a TDMSD test and reject a null hypothesis based on this distribution here, that that really means there has been selection. But it nonetheless is informative of the degree of differences in allele frequencies between this model and what you actually see. And that's the interpretation of that today. Okay, I only have a few more minutes left. Is that right? Um, I wanted to talk much more. Just mention a few, one other approach that people have been using for detecting selection. That is, in particular, when people are interested in selection that's currently acting. Most of the time, we talk about selection in terms of that there's been a sweep. And so that you had an advantageous mutation that arose in the population and then went to fixation, it reached a frequency of 100% of one in the population. But often, you're even more interested in figuring out, is any selection that's acting right now? Okay, so for example, in human population, is there any strong selection on acting right now in the allele that's spreading in the population? And what people use, 
to look at that is that they, they, they sort of the intuition behind what's being done is that if you have an allele like that, that's spreading in the population, so it hasn't reached a high frequency, there will be this class of haplotypes that are all more or less identical, that have recently increased in frequency because they all carry that advantageous mutation. And there will be another class of haplotypes that have the amount of variability you would expect to see if there has been no selective sweep. So you can look at the amount, you can look for mutations for which it's true that those mutations are on very long haplotypes will, uh, that are identical to each other as compared to the other allelic class where there's not a lot of what's called haplotype homozygosity, so identical uh, haplotypes like this. So that's a, p a pattern that people are looking for. And there are a couple of different ways that it's often, uh, that a couple of different tests that takes advantage of that uh, pattern. And the kind of thing that they're looking for is something like this. Here you take uh, in a particular genome, in a particular position in the genome where you think there's been selection. Look at two alleles. Okay, one that's associated with the red color, one that's associated with the blue color. Every time you take the longest, the pair of haplotypes that are, have the longest amount of haplotype identity between them and make that a reference haplotype for the red one and for the blue one. And then you ask, what's the amount of shared identity along the genome with these two types? So what you will see is that there's a red type here with lots of long haplotype shared identity, and the blue type, not so much, long, not so much many long tracks of shared identity. The pattern that you would expect if there's ongoing selection. So this is from one of the most famous cases of selection in the human genome, the LCT or lactase, locus that has to do with evolution of um, lactase persistence, the fact that you can digest milk as adult, that you're not lactose intolerant, where there's been large amount of selection, particularly in European populations, for a particular variant that gives you that la uh, lactase persistence, and that's linked to this, uh, the breast haplotype here. Okay, so I think I'm gonna, um, not to run out of time, I think I'm simply gonna s stop stop there and then maybe instead have some time for questions and discussion. Okay. Seems like there was some discussion. Yeah, um, so the question is, um, there's a paper recently that looked at the constraint on synonymous sites in coding regions coming from transcription factor binding and other things. And obviously we've known that that happens, but the estimate that they had was 15% of synonymous sites were under potential constraint. So that's higher than I would have expected, and I'm curious how much that throws off um, DNDS type estimates of selection. I mean, I think it shows for us about to a certain degree if you think that the same constraints don't apply in the amino acid changing positions. Right, so this is so so this is sort of certain constraint at the nucleotide level that exists. But that's also, you know, if the question is how much of that goes out in the wash if it also applies to amino acid changing mutations. And I think that more work is needed on that. Um, I'm you know, I'm, I so I've been doing a lot of this with these sort of DNTS ratios and so on, but I think that the you know, you should always take it with a little bit of grain of salt. These, you know, there are a lot of things that can affect these ratios. I think the most important thing, even more important than that, I think, are the fact that most data has some uh, alignment errors, and that really affects these, these kind of things a lot. So, for example, um, number of scans try to take selection that have been published, where it turns out, you know, you, you shift the alignment by a little bit, and then a third position becomes a second position. So all your synonymous mutations now are non synonymous. And then, number of papers where I have found wonderful selection in this gene and that gene because of this kind of error. So I think a lot of things, I think any type of, any time that you make an inference purely bioinformatically about selection like this, I think there are problems with all of these different approaches. And I think you want, typically want to, if you really want to believe that there's something important functional behind you, also want to then look at some of the functional information. And just a public service announcement, like it's not just the alignment issue, but the sequences that you align. So with a lot of these tests, you're you're picking out orthologous genes across species, and like for instance, if you download things like data from UCSC because that's convenient, that those aren't meant for. That's not meant for identifying orthologous genes. It's a whole genome alignment that they subset later. So there's a, a decent chance that the gene that you are aligning is not related at all to one that you're interested in. So yeah, the. Uh, worthwhile detection is a huge deal. I guess I just want to make a, sort of a general comment. I mean, part of the difficulty, it seems, is you know, what questions is one trying to get at? 
right? I mean, somehow the neutral theory, and is the neutral theory right or wrong, always seem to complete non sequitur. I mean, of course it's wrong on long time scales. It might be right on short time scales, right? So then one starts having to talk about time scales and which aspects one is talking about and how strong various effects um, are. And then one is getting into quantitative things and one's not trying to neglect, neglect null hypotheses and so on. One is trying to say, okay, one is more of a picture of the dynamics of what's going on and is trying to infer things from that or learn things about, uh, about that. Um, so if one goes to the you know, it's an opposite regime from humans and looks at pathogens, right? I mean, it, but, um, like HIV or flu, or looks at Labarge evolution, right? and then you start looking at some of the simple statistics, and you see if you look at uh, the frequency, they may not look that different, but as soon as you start looking at distributions and things which there are the predictions of, and there's you know, deep data, you find they're completely different. There may not be some nice statistical test that will give you a p-value for it, but there are you know, enormous effects. But then one is trying to distinguish between various definite um, um, scenarios that involve some understanding of the underlying, uh, underlying dynamics. Right? So I mean, I think one of the hopes maybe in this, this workshop is to kind of sort of you know, move towards more of a, of a wide range of of questions that I think have you know, historically have often been looked at in the, um, in the field. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, don't think I disagree. I mean, I think much focus has been on how to can you detect if there has been selection, right? right? I mean, that's been the, how right. the problem was formulated. Has there been selection or not, and how do you best detect that? Right. And I agree that we need to move on to better understand how has selection actually operated. Yeah. And we know there has been selection, right? We, we, yeah, we, yeah. So I mean, I think, you know, so we agree on that. But I think if you go to a meeting with evolutionary biologists, you'll find a lot of people that say, well, if I look at genetic variation within a species, then the vast majority of genes that I see in the vast majority of variability, has, there's been no selection on any of that. And it's not been affected really by selection anyway. I think you'll find a very large proportion of people that will agree with that statement. So, and for them, for them, it will be, you know, um, still very important to show that it's been any selection at all. I, I, I think that that question is not interesting anymore, but I think you'll still find some people that say that. So, um, I don't know, what are some of the other people that have go to these biology meetings, what do you think? Is that right? <laughs> you know, no, you also some worked important. on selection, right? Well, what? I think I can out myself as a person who thinks that it's important to keep in mind that probably we have like a nearly neutral model that's pretty much true and then we have to consider also alternative explanations a lot to selection and I'm also I mean I'm also someone who's interested in instances of selection but I think it's a quite a hard problem that's sort of a different viewpoint uh, yeah, I'm worried that we don't find any neutral regions anymore Sorry? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're working for software as well, right? right. I mean, it, to some, it might be quite I mean, yeah, to software, I think the conclusion now is from recent papers that it's just all selection. Like, we can't really, the neutral models, we can't really understand it anymore. I think that's what most of the recent papers on to software is pointing towards. I think humans, so there's a debate, is, do we not see it in humans because we're not living the right way? Or is, are humans fundamentally different because we're low effective population size, for example? And I think maybe I'm not in there the same team on that, but I think that some people would even disagree with that and think that even humans there's much more selection than we are and we have previously appreciated. So there are different opinions about that. So I think I guess it's there's still you know some debate about that. But I think it's sort of the theory I would agree that really what we need to understand what we don't have I think are really, really good me methods for understanding, you know, if we have some data relating that to different models of selection and how selection is operated and really understand yeah, the, the phenotypic side is completely unknown. In all these tests, we don't know what the phenotype is. Yeah, so that's another issue, right? That makes it a little bit boring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. That's easy. But you know, if you do laboratory evolution of yeast in the lab, and you see all kinds of beneficial relations coming up, and in a real sense, we don't know what the phenotypes of those are, and it's not entirely clear that it's well defined. Right? I mean, they're complicated interactions with the. With, um, uh, with the environment, and it's a marginal gain of one aspect and marginal loss of another aspect, and so on. The number of things that may happen, this may be quite a problem, the number of things that have dramatic <coughs> effects may be very small, even if there's an enormous amount of selection going on. And so then, if one you know, is looking at the humans or Drosophila, presumably questions of, okay, is whatever selection is primarily going on on individual genes, or is almost all of it involve a lot of epistasis? I mean, I've, I think the, the Drosophila problem is that there's so much selection in nearby genes that you don't see the selection on each gene, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're starting to think there. So that, you know, these models where we, you know, we use the rest as sort of, assume it's neutral and look at one gene, is that different from the rest? And so on, that, that has misled us in Drosophila to, really, to not realize how much selection there really is. Um, at least I know a number of software geniuses that believe that these days. 
um, because they because of linkage, right? Um, linkage and stasis. Yeah, and uh, yeah, stasis. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much.